everyone, welcome back. My name is Diana, this is my channel Bookish Die, and today I am wrapping up my October in reading. So overall, my October was much better than my September, where I only read two books. This past month, I read eight books. It potentially could have been more. I did start some books I didn't finish, um, but that was mostly due to I got sick towards the end of the month and I just didn't have the brain power to finish what I started. But overall, I'm pretty happy with the eight books I read. It was a fairly romance heavy month for me, which I'm not gonna complain about. Um, I did enjoy the romances I read. So let's get into it. The first book that I read in October was The Wedding Crasher by Mia Sosa. This is her companion novel to The Worst Best Man, which I read last year. And this book centers on Solange, who is a woman who, she's the cousin to Lena, who is the protagonist in The Worst Best Man. And at the wedding for Lena's boyfriend's bestie, she discovers the bride is not really in love with um, Dean, who's the, the male romantic lead for this book. And she is trying to ask her childhood lo or love interest lover to, you know, give her a reason to call off the wedding and he doesn't. And so Solange ends up, Solange ends up crashing the wedding and the wedding ends up being called off. And then due to mutual shenanigans, both uh, Solange and uh, Dean need, say that they have a significant other when they don't. And so they have to fake date for a while and they end up, you know, being attracted to each other and falling in love. Um, you know, it's a romance, that's not a spoiler. So I did enjoy this one. I ended up giving it a 3.75 stars. I think that Mia Sosa can go a little overboard with like the shenanigans, but it was really entertaining and the character like the stuff that happened made sense with the two characters that she was building so um with Solange her um being a little bit afraid of commitment being a little bit like wanting to be swept off her feet and having like love and not really wanting to commit to anything before that or someone who can't offer her that and she's also one of the plot points with her is her trying to figure out um, what she's going to be doing with her life because she's currently in the D.C. area going to grad school, but she does have a job offer to move to Ohio to work at a nonprofit. And she's trying to figure out, does she want that? Um, does she want to stay near her family? And then with Dean, you have him trying to make partner at this fairly competitive law firm and he is trying to impress someone like he has been assigned along with a colleague who's a piece of shit uh to try and impress someone that the firm is attempting to recruit and yeah I will say one of the things that kind of rubbed me the wrong way with this book and the reason I ended up giving it like a 3.75 instead of a 4 is I think this and I don't know if the author really thought of it this way, but one of the things with Dean is that he's not really looking for a love connection. He's, um, because for him, he's been burned by his mom essentially falling in and out of love. And I don't know, I felt like this could have been a really great place for like someone on the aromantic spectrum. Like I was actually kind of hoping that Dean maybe would have been on the arrow spectrum just because I think that could have made a real, for a really interesting like love story but that wasn't necessarily what Soso -so was going for and um I don't know it just it felt like a missed opportunity it felt like the lesson that came lesson that came from this was you know you're you just haven't met the right person you just haven't met the right you know you just haven't had the right situation or you're just walling yourself off and, you know, I get this is a romance novel, there is a love story, but I think it could have been, I don't know, just really interesting had Dean been on the arrow spectrum. I don't know. I, I'm not really sure, like, I'm articulating it well, but that was just the way it just, something about that particular aspect kind of rubbed me the wrong way and ended up docking some uh, some stars off my rating. But overall, I did enjoy it. I know Mia Sosa has some 
other books in her backlist that I might go back and read because I did enjoy both The Wedding Crasher and The Worst Best Man and I think she might end up in one of my regular romance or my regular rotation of romance authors. After that, I read a nonfiction book. It called Bad Mexicans, Race, Empire, and Revolution in the Borderlands by Kelly Lytle Hernandez. So I had found out about this book browsing through um, LA Public Library's Overdrive. It was one of their recent nonfiction purpose purchases, and I thought it sounded interesting. I did end up borrowing the physical copy from my library, but I had to turn it in. Anyway, um, so this is a nonfiction account set primarily in the years leading up to the Mexican Revolution in the 1910s. So this is a history, this is focusing on uh, Ricardo Flores uh, Magón, who was one of the revolutionaries who led a revolutionary group called the Magonistas that was active both in Mexico and in the borderlands um, on the U.S. side of the border. And it goes into what the situation was in Mexico at the time, focusing on the heavy exploitation by American companies, by American uh, millionaires, with the consent of Porfirio Diaz, who was the president at the time. It kind of goes into the politics around those opposing Diaz. So you not only have um, Flores Magón, you also had um, Victor, no, uh, Francisco Maduro. Um, you get a little bit about, you know, Pancho, uh, about Emiliano Zapata, but it's mostly focused on Flores Magón and his particular group and kind of how it came about and going into what the politics were, what actions that they were taking um, in the years leading up to the Mexican Revolution and also going into um, kind of the interconnectedness between Mexico and the United States. So not just um, like on the exploitation, but also documenting like the migration of people and why people were moving to the United States from Mexico and also going on about or talking about how um, the Mexican government's actions were heavily influenced by what was going on in the States. Um, so yeah, this was, a, this was really interesting. So I, I am familiar with, you know, kind of the broad strokes of the Mexican Revolution. So, you know, Pancho Villa, Emiliano Zapata, um, Victoriano Huerta taking over from Maduro. Um, and then, you know, the founding of what's, you know, the modern Mexican state and the pre kind of taking over for 70 odd years until um, Vincente Fox's party won back in 20, 2000, sorry, back in 2000. Okay, so like I had the broad strokes, but I didn't really know much about the time period leading up to that. So I thought that was really interesting. I also really liked the focus on the borderlands and kind of focusing on how everything was interconnected. This also served like serves a bit of like a piece of history of the labor movement because that was so heavily entwined with what was going on with the Magonistas as well as the lead up to the Mexican Revolution. So you had a lot of labor exploitation on both sides of the border and any attempts uh, by workers, particularly in Mexico, to organize, to try and, you know, get better wages, better living conditions was often met with force either from the American corporations or the Mexican government. And so I thought that was very fascinating. I thought the lens that um, Lettel Hernandez took was really interesting. So I, I really enjoyed this. I ended up giving this about 4.25 out of five stars. It's definitely something that I'm really glad I read. Actually, um, my grandfather doesn't watch these videos, so I can say this here. I'm thinking about getting this for my grandfather because this is right up his alley in terms of um, history that he likes to read. I would definitely recommend it, especially if you're interested in learning more about how the U.S. and Mexico are interconnected. Following that, the third book that I read was Prayer for the Crown Shy by Becky Chambers. This is the second in her Monk and Robot series, and this is the continuing adventures of the T-Monk Dex and the Robot Moss Cap. 
And this picks up shortly after the first novella ends where they're on their way back to kind of the human settled areas of the moon of, I want to say, I think it's Panga. Um, and so it kind of documents their journey. So I read this um, as for a podcast with my friend Renee, Fangirl Happy Hour. The pot, As of when I'm recording this, the podcast episode where we discussed this hasn't been released. But in short, I did like this not quite as much as um, A Psalm for the Wild Built. And partially it was because I think there were two things going on in this novella that didn't always work for me in, uh, like they didn't work in conjunction for me the same way that A Psalm for the Wild build did. So in this one, there are two things. One is Dex is still really struggling with burnout, struggling with the feeling of what are they going to be, what should they do? Um, do they have purpose without doing you know, the work of being a tea monk. Um, one thing that kind of comes up in the course of this novella is they haven't really done a tea ceremony in quite a while. And that's their whole thing is they are a tea monk. They, you know, offer tea and solace and companionship to people. And then this also kind of serves as a travel log. So we get to see more of the moon, more of the different types of civilization and of um, the Dex comes from and you get a sense of how different communities have been adapting to kind of the events that led to the robots gaining sentience and leaving. So it was, it was very interesting to see, um, you know, the different types of ways people were living. But I felt like the burnout um, portion of it was, wasn't seated equally throughout and so it just it didn't it felt like that was more of a second half thing than a first half thing in this and because it's so short like it for me it did need to be more evenly seated throughout however I did really like this book I did think that it's a really interesting world and I don't know if Chambers is planning on continuing this series if she has more that she wants to do with this world but I I would be open to it. Like there's definitely like sequel, there's definitely a place, like the way this ends, it could be a complete story, but there also could be more stories with Dex and Mothcap. I ended up giving this another 4.25 out of five and I continue to really enjoy Becky Chambers writing. After that, I read Miss Meteor written by Taylor Kim Mejia and Anna Marie McLemore narrated by uh, Kyla Garcia and El Guerra. So I ended up, um, splitting between listening to the audiobook and reading the physical uh, copy of this. So this is a YA magical realism, I think is the best way to describe it, um, novel that follows two girls. You have Chiki, which is short for Chiquita, who is the youngest of four sisters whose family owns the diner Salinas and she's queer she's current at, at the start of the book she's in the closet and she's struggling with bullying she's struggling with feeling out of place and then you also have Lita who is a girl who made a stardust she came from a falling star and she is slowly turning back into stardust and um, as a way to kind of have a last hurrah and maybe allow herself, allow her to stay, she decides to enter the Miss Meteor pageant where she doesn't have, where she knows she has, she has no chance of winning. She's, you know, short, she's curvy, she's brown, and that's not the type of girl that gets crowned beauty queen. She's also dealing with bullying and she and Chicky had been friends, but they've been estranged for a number of years. So this book sees them coming back and trying to win the pageant and be true to themselves. So content warnings for this one for bullying, bullying, homophobia, xenophobia, some transphobia. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this one, I, I read uh, Kayla Kamehia's young first middle grade book. And I, I love Emory McLemore's writing. They're one of my favorite writers. So I, I had been I had high hopes for this. Um, it mostly fit it. This definitely reads younger than I was initially expecting. So I actually would recommend this for maybe younger teens. But 
Um, this book really thrives off of like hijinks and shenanigans um, to an extent that I wasn't necessarily expecting. So there's a lot of like pitfalls and mishaps that happen to the characters and it can be a little it can be a lot at times like there were times where like my secondhand embarrassment was a little bit overwhelmed and I had to stop and walk away but I think but I did enjoy the you know exploration of friendship like how do two girls who ha used to be so close become estranged and then come back together I really enjoyed the themes of queer community building so um, you have Chicky, you have her love interest, Junior, um, Cole, who is Lita's love interest, is trans. Um, so I really liked the community building aspect and people coming together for a goal and like that solidarity component. Um, Chicky and Lita, I thought were very, they, I, I thought that the authors did a good job of keeping them distinct. Like I never, got mixed up as to which point of view I was reading. Um, there, like this book can get heavy at times. Like it, it doesn't shy away from the realities of being queer and brown um, and in a predominantly white place um, and kind of what happens with that, um, both for the girls and for their families. But I, I did enjoy it. I gave it a 3.75 out of five stars. Um, I'm glad I finally read it. I've had this book on my shelf for a few years. Um, it's not my favorite Macklemore, but it's, you know, not terror. Like, I have yet to read something either fully written or co-written by Anna Marie Macklemore that I haven't, at least at some point, for some, like, I haven't enjoyed. Um, and this definitely fits that bill. Following that, I read The Very Secret Society of Irregular, Wh Irregular Witches by um, Sangu Mandana. This is a witchy romance novel and it follows um, Mika, or Mika Moon, who is a witch as all witches are. Her, her mother died, her parents died when she was very young. She was orphaned and she was raised by this British witch, uh, Primrose. Mika is... Uh, Indian from or South yeah she's Indian and so she was raised by Primrose and she's trying to you know make her way in the world so she starts posting YouTube videos where she's you know pretending to be a witch she's not you know showing her true powers and she gets emailed by uh she gets contacted to serve as a tutor for three young witches um Rosetta, Terracotta, and Ultimira, I think is that last one. And she arrives at, at this house called the Nowhere House where there are three older people, um, Ken, Ian, and I am forgetting the housekeeper's name, and then Jamie, who is the librarian. And so she has to teach the girls how to control their powers and also, um, she and Jamie fall in love and they have to try and figure out a way to protect the girls, um, and keep them in their home. So this is delightful. I haven't read anything by Mandana before. I know she's written more YA novels. I think this might be her first adult novel. And this was just, it was delightful. I thought that the bits of world building that we got were really interesting, um, especially because it's not a very long book. I really enjoyed Mika, Mika and Jamie's voices. Um, I will say for, for in terms of the romance, it's probably like it's there and it's definitely something I liked, but it's not necessarily the main point of the book I, I would say like the main thrust of this book is me Micah finding her community and finding a place where she can belong after moving so often and feeling unmoored and also kind of challenging traditions that she was raised in and I would like I would say the real romance in this is the found family <laughs> component with this, um, which as a lover of found families, I liked. Um, so if you're going in looking for something more romance heavy, you might be disappointed. But if you go, if you're going in looking for something that's more 
on the found family scale, this will definitely work for you, I think. Um, I also really liked how Madonna wrote the three girls. I thought they were very distinct and they felt their ages. Um, and they felt like how girls that, like how weird girls that age could be. Um, I also thought that the magic in this was really interesting and how, um, and how you're shown how, how the world operates. I don't know if Mandana is planning on writing anything else in this series. I definitely would be very interested because there's some aspects to the story that I think leave it open for additional stories in this universe, but it definitely, you definitely have that closed ending for this particular book. Um, so in all, I gave it four out of five stars. I really enjoyed it. And I definitely would be interested in reading some of her YA novels just to kind of see what's there and see if there's something that I enjoy in it. After that, I read On the Hustle by Adriana Herrera. This is the second book in her, um, Here to Stay series or Dating in Dallas, I think is the actual title. So the Dating in Dallas series, this follows Here to Stay. And this book centers on Alba, who is the best friend um, of the lead here to stay, who it has been working for a PA for a real estate magnate, Theo Ganas, for a number of years. And she's finally quitting to do her dream job of, start, of doing her own business for bookish themed uh, home makeover. And she's moving to Dallas to oversee a library expansion. And she... Um, doesn't has conflict has mixed feelings for her her ex boss and she's you know he's very attractive but also he's very cold and she gets the sense that he doesn't really care about her um when it turns out the opposite is true Theo Ganes has been wildly attracted to Alba ever since she started working for him and because of that has been super strict about not letting that show at all and he had been planning on trying to court her after she left and her moving to Dallas just throws everything through a loop so he follows her and comes to her with a reality tv proposal and it's a romance they get together like anyway so I I did enjoy this I really like Adriana Herrera's writing I Definitely liked how she approached the potential complications of an employer-employee romance in that the employee, the employer like was super attractive, but like nothing happened when he when they were working together. Like he did not let her know. He's like, oh my God, I would love to make out with you. I'd love to date you. Like nothing happened. So I do like that component. I also really liked Alba as a lead. So she is someone who had has been like the rock for her family. She has put some a lot of her dreams on hold to try and help her mother, help her sister, help her grandmother. And at the beginning of the book is her taking that leap to finally do something that's pretty much only for her. I also did like Theo as a male lead. There were times where he got a little too alpha hole for me, um, but he didn't quite go there. Um, I also liked that part of the story was Alba learning to kind of take a step back and take care of herself. Um, one thing that did kind of annoy me is um, Alba at various points, she's like, oh my God, no, he won't want to stay with me or like no one will love me because I'm so chaotic. I'm so chaotic. And I never got the sense that she was chaotic. I got the sense she was someone who overbooked herself who didn't always who didn't really prioritize her well-being she would always prioritize the well-being of others like her chaos quote-unquote chaos was something that we were told about and never really shown and so that like her fixating on that and no one kind of being like honey you are not chaotic you are just very focused and are very bad about you know taking on too many commitments um, so that was a little weird and that was a little off-putting because I'm like, girl, you're not chaotic. Like, I could understand chaotic if it was, oh god, just like forgetting things or like switching things mid-tactic, but I never got that sense. I don't know. The whole chaotic thing just felt like a, it, it felt very odd to me. Um, but yeah, overall, I enjoyed it, aside from the occasional uh, forays into Alpha Hold'em. 
the third act breakup was what it was. Um, it was one of the things where it's like you can see the car crash coming. Leia, come here. Where you can like see the car crash coming. You're like, oh, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Oh, no, you did the thing. You did the thing. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, I was going somewhere with this. Anyway, I, I, anyway, I did enjoy this. I gave it 3.75 out of five stars. I, I continue to really like Adrian Herrera's writing. Like it just, it works for me. I will say I liked this one a little bit better than her historical just because, um, this one was a, much less insta love. Um, but that's just me. Look who decided to join like unhand me <laughs> anyway the second to last book that I read in October was The Prisoner of Lemnos by Lois McMaster Bujold this is like the fifth or sixth in the Penric and Desdemona series and this picks up shortly after Mira's Last Dance and here we find Penric living in, being in Orbas. He is wanting to court Nykus, who is um, the sister of the general he was sent to recruit and then he ended up rescuing um, and sprinting them out of the country uh, or out of their empire that they're living in after the general um, was accused of treason. All in story. And in this, he... Nykus has decided, you know, I, I I don't necessarily feel comfortable because, you know, you have Desdemona, this demon living with you, and I'm not sure how to deal with that, and all these past lives. And so Penrick's being a little mopey at the start. And then Nykus gets word that her mother ha is being held hostage as a way to try and draw out, I want to say, I think it's Adelis? Um to try and draw them out. And so Penric and Nykus and Desdemona, of course, have to sneak back into the Empire to try and rescue Nykus's mom. And shenanigans ensue because it's a Bujold novel. novel. I loved this. Um, I just, reading Bujold is like having a warm hug in book form for me at this point. I just, I love Penric and Desdemona. Desdemona is just so snarky and so lovely. Um, excuse you. Why are you biting me? She bit me. Um, should have named you Des. Anyway, um, where was I? Um, basically, this is just a warm hug in book format. I really liked, um, the short, like, seeing Penric and Des, Penric and Nykus try and figure out how to rescue Nykus's mom and what happens when two plans kind of intersect because one person, like one group doesn't know that the other group is planning something and how it comes together and works out because, you know, this is a world where the gods exist and sometimes they make their own luck uh, for their favorite followers of which Penric is one. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I, I don't know what else to say. I, I, I okay. I will also say that Bujold definitely has a type of uh, heroine for her heroes, for her hero's romantic interests, and that is mostly uh, busty widows, which, you know, Bujold likes what she likes in terms of romance. I will give her that. Um, I will say I like how distinct Nykus is from McCatrin because there are things that are similar about, but they're very different characters. Anyway, I would say if you're looking for romance, or not, if you're looking for fantasy that is on the shorter side, that has really great characters, really interesting world building, please pick up the Penrick and Desdemona novel novels slash novellas. They're so much fun. I really like them. I love Bouchold. I'm really sad that I just got rid of these too late to buy the nice subterranean press versions without uh, bankrupting myself, but it is what it is. Um, I think I give this 4.5 out of 5 stars, so just, I love it. I love Penn and Des. So great. The final book that I read in October was The Stand-Up Groomsman by Jackie Lau. This is the companion novel to Donut Fall in Love, which I read last year, and it follows Vivian, who is the roommate of Lindsay, the heroine from the first novel, and Mel, who is Ryan's best friend. 
who's a stand-up comic. Stop trying to bite me, you brat. <laughs> anyway, um, so it follows them and they had initially met in Donut Fall in Love and it didn't go well and they're kind of thrown back together when Ryan and Lindsay are getting married and Vivian is one of the bridesmaids and Mel is the best man and they start forming a friendship and then they fall in love um, because it is a romance and yeah I really enjoyed this I like Jackie Lau's writing like it's very comforting it's very um it's not like warm hug level like Bujol but like I I know the type of story that I'm going to be getting and I just I really enjoy her writing. Um, one thing in particular I really liked about this book is one is or there are a few things I really liked about this. One is that both characters are bi so Mel and Vivian are both bi so I would count this as a queer romance just because they end up with opposite sex partners doesn't make it not queer. Um, and so you have Mel who's much more comfortable in his bisexuality, whereas Vivian, it's something that she came to later in life and it's something that she's still kind of working out, like, um, how she expresses it, how she, uh, stop trying to bite me. This is the face of a cat who keeps biting me while I'm trying to pet her. Anyway. Um, so I really liked that both of the leads were queer and it was something that they discussed and it was something that came up at various points. Um, I also really liked that one, like that, um, kind of the roles were reversed in who is kind of the emotionally closed off aloof person versus who is the one doing the emotional labor. So one of the things that comes up in this book and that gets explored is that Vivian is very much the eldest daughter. And yes, I meant that with capital letters for everything. She is someone who um, had a lot of responsibility placed on her by her parents growing up and she essentially raised her younger siblings. And because of that, there's a lot of trauma and a lot of healing that needs to be done in terms of her relationship with her siblings as well as her parents and so that's one of the through lines that is going on in the book you also kind of contrast that with mel's family where his father isn't in the picture because his father reacted really badly to him coming out when he was a teenager but you have his mother and his grandmother who keeps trying to set him up on dates and his grandmother is a hoot she loves singing to Shania Twain in karaoke. She is fantastic. Um, and so you have this more kind of open loving family with Mel. And so um, you kind of see why the characters are the way they are. Um, the third I brought up was what it was. But overall, I did really enjoy this book. I thought that Jackie Lau just does such a good job with kind of exploring some deeper themes with her romances where she has, like I said, Vivian trying to deal with her, you know, being the eldest daughter and all the baggage that comes with that and Mel trying to, you know, show Vivian that it's okay that they don't necessarily have like the quote unquote traditional happy ever after, um, but what they do have will work for them. Oh, and related to that, one thing I really appreciate um, is that Vivian is very clear that she doesn't want kids and Mel respects that. Mel is like, look, you don't want kids. That's fine. Like I have my nieces who I can spoil to my heart's content. That's totally fine if you don't want to have kids. Um, and he respects her choice and doesn't ever try to change her mind. So again, I really like that. I just, I love Jackie Lau's writing. For me, this is four point stars out of, or four, four stars out of five. I really recommend picking up uh, both Do Not Fall in Love and The Stand-Up Groomsman. I don't know if we're going to be getting a third book in this series, but I will absolutely read it if it does happen. So that was my October. Like I said, very romance heavy. Even the fantasies I read, like especially Prisoner of Limnos, like even though it's fantasy, I kind of count that as a romance because Penrick and Nikus, um get together. So yeah, very romance heavy October, weirdly enough, like no spooky books, all the romance. I don't know. Anyway, do any of these books, have you read any of these books? Do you also love Bujold's writing? Um, please let me know in the comments below. Um, look at this little criminal. 
Anyway, thank you all so much for watching. And if you enjoyed what you see, please like and subscribe. Thank you all so much and have a great rest of your day. Bye.